In neurology, uh, we've come an incredibly long way in the last few decades in terms of studying how the brain works. We know how it works, how it thinks, and how it learns. And after all, we're here to learn. That's how we got here. Our brains learned over hundreds of thousands of years. And in the brain, learning basically takes place through three steps. The first is information. That's what we're doing now. You're listening to me, you're getting information, hopefully. The second step is you're going to be taking that information and filing it into a knowledge base, into different parts of the library in your mind. And the third stage is the most important stage, and that's the stage that we call wisdom formation. That's the ability to take different parts of the library and link them together to solve problems that are both known as well as unknown. That's what makes you a good thinker. Now, neurologically, the interesting thing is that there's no direct path from information to wisdom. You have to go through something. You have to go through a process. And that process involves stress. We call it positive frustration. Ideally, it's trial and error. You're forced into making mistakes. Neurologically, the smartest brain in the world is the one that's made every single mistake. So let's see how our evolution looks like now that we know how to learn. We started all the way on the left four million years ago. About three million years ago, we got to the middle. And about 75 years ago, we got to that computer console. And about 25 years ago, we got to that digital tablet, which all of us have in our hands. And some of you are pointing them at me, filming me, and taking pictures of me. What have we been doing during that time in the, in the last 20 years? Well, we've upped our digital viewership to seven hours a day for the average adult, nine hours a day for the average child and teenagers. Each of you check your cell phone on average 50 times a day. That means if I do it once, you do it 100 times. 45% of you communicate between each other under the same roof. If it's a child or an adolescent, they communicate between each other only one out of three times directly. Two out of three communications between our children take place through the digital world. Now, what's happened over the last 20 years along with this? Well, we're getting dumber. IQs have stopped increasing and have flattened out. Standardized scores across the world are dropping year by year, accelerated by COVID. We're getting more depressed. Anxiety is shooting up through the roof, 70% in adolescence, so much so that 32% of people between 8 and 18 have an anxiety disorder. The United States Preventative Services Task Force has issued a guideline saying that all children between 8 and 18 need to be screened for anxiety. I used to screen kids for bumps and bruises and headaches, vaccinations. Now I have to screen them for anxiety. Why? Why is this happening neurologically? Well, in 1964, a fellow named Marshall McLuhan wrote a book called The Media is the Message. Not the message is the message, but the media is the message. And quite simply, in that book, he said, the way that the brain gets information is more important than the information itself. And it kind of makes sense. If you get information through little snippets and sound bites and little TikToks and SMSs, you're going to develop what we call short in, short out. Your library is going to have small shelves, small books, and it's not going to have that wisdom part. Nothing's going to be connected to different parts of the library because you haven't been forced to think about anything. So you're not going to be smart. You're not going to be able to think problems through. And when a real life problem comes up, you're not going to be able to delete it because there's no delete button in real life. So you're going to get anxious and, God forbid, even take your life. That's why today more people in the world kill themselves than die from war, terrorism, and murder combined. This has been accelerated in the last few decades by the creation of the perfect storm. Two things have happened, prosperity and the creation of the Internet. Prosperity has given us a lot of time, and the Internet is taking that time because most of us are spending our time on the Internet doing things that are literally addictive. 
We're not using it to design plastic pipes. We're using it to catch the news, communicate with our friends, be on video, and so on and so forth. And all of these activities are designed via what's called algorithms, and they're basically schemes to make you think that the internet is there for you, and it's all supported by rises in dopamine. Dopamine is the feel-good chemical in the brain that goes up whenever you win in the casino or whenever you think you're going to win in the casino. And my friends, my colleagues, some of whom work in California, where there's nothing good that ever happens, sit next to those computer programmers and they actually measure the dopamine. When the dopamine goes up, the program gets made. And when they came up with this, the dopamine went through the roof. Because you start to count this, and this gives you verification of who you are. And of course, even better than this is this, because this has to be changed to this. So in doing so, you create the perfect feedback loop. And you create a casino in the mind. And finally, along came a perfect invention to make all of this worse. No, it's not Arnold Palmer in the late 60s. I love this slide because it's, he's such a snappy guy. And um, th look at the gallery. They've got shirts and ties and jackets, and the ladies are all in skirts. And this is the Masters Tournament uh, in Augusta in the late 60s. This is the way that golf used to be played. And this is the way it's played today. Same tournament, Tiger Woods. If you don't take a picture of it, it doesn't exist. The cell phone. Each one of you has it. Each one of you. Some of you may not be wearing underwear, but all of you have a cell phone. 50% <laughs> of teenagers surveyed said they'd rather break an arm than lose their cell phone. I'm not making this up. Adults who are supposed to be smarter, 50% would rather lose their wallet with their credit cards and money than lose their cell phone. Yes, somebody said, mm-hmm. Have you lost your wallet? <laughs> so, what's happening? Social singularity. We're all starting to behave, look, and feel like each other. And this is a problem because it deforms the human priority of thinking and reasoning because individual thinking no longer matters unless it's verified by the group. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the beginning of herd behavior. It's the human colony. It's the human anthill. You flick a little part of the anthill, and the whole anthill goes berserk. And as a result of that, you basically have deformed human priorities and individuality, and you create, effectively, a caste system. Who knew about this? Doesn't somebody know about this? Of course, Albert Einstein knew about this. Conrad Lawrence knew about this. Stephen Hawking knew about this when they said it's technology that's going to destroy mankind. That's the kind of technology they were talking about. The creators of the technology, Bill Gates, Melinda Gates, Steve Jobs, did not allow their children to have their inventions at home. They sent them and continue to send them. Look this up to schools in Silicon Valley, such as the Waldorf School, where they don't have any computers. Paper and pencil. They know why. Countries know this. France, Australia, China have banned cell phones in school. Amnesty International has labeled Google and Facebook as the single greatest threat to human privacy. The World Health Organization and the American Academy of Physicians, 70,000 phys physicians strong, have issued the following guidelines on digital technology use for children. No screen for any child zero to two years old. One year, with su I'm sorry, uh, between two and five years old, one hour a day with supervision, and between five and 15, two hours a day with supervision. So ladies and gentlemen, if you want to impair the social and intellectual ability of your child, give them a cell phone. This is a really interesting slide. I'm going to pause here just for a second. What do you see and what do you not see? Well, only one elephant has tusks. It's the one on the right. 
I love the little baby elephant in the middle getting protected, but be that as it may, all elephants should have tusks, and only one does. This is a slide from a natural reserve in Africa, and the elephants are killed for their tusks by poachers. So what they've done is they've developed a mutation where they're born without them. It impairs their social order, but at least they stay alive. This is an example of devolution, of the losing of a capability that's been acquired over hundreds of thousands of years. This is a composite slide of children's brains from a study in Cincinnati Hospital several years ago, where they took children and they looked at the integrity of a great highway in the mind that connects the frontal lobe on the left side, which is the thinking part of the brain, with the memory part and the language part around. And the parts that you see in blue are the parts of the highway that are literally starting to turn to mush. They're softening up. And they're doing so in those children in direct proportion to the amount of time that they spend looking at a screen. This is anatomic devolution of the human brain that is happening here and now. We are losing something that it took us 400,000 years to acquire. So where do we go from here? Well, we have to realize that in the last 20 years, we've changed more than we have in the last 200,000 years. We need to put us and technology back into each proper place. As far as technology is concerned, does it need to be faster? Does it need to be quicker? Do we need a car that's going to know how to drive itself? Who's going to know how to drive a car? And as far as artificial intelligence is concerned, yes, it's great. It's great for a lot of things, but the first word is still artificial. It's still a program. And shouldn't the question at the end of the day be not whether or not we're going to have a computer that's going to think as well as a person, but whether we're going to have a person who's going to think differently from a computer? As far as we're concerned, we only really have one job in life, and that's to have children. Raise them, educate them, and then get out of the way. Children have no rights that can be bought. They have a right to be loved, they have a right to be educated, they do not have the right to an iPhone. And if they can't go into a store and buy a bottle of vodka, why should we let them sit in front of a screen for 10 hours a day and fry their brains? For the last 85 years, Harvard has been doing a study on happiness. They've been following thousands of people, families for several generations, and they found that human happiness is the number one indicator of success, medical success, health-wise, financial success. And happiness itself has one single chief cause, the number of direct, face-to-face, -face human biological friendships that you have. Generally, no more than four or five. So let's start putting our cell phones down and start being friends again. We've climbed up the tree of life to a very high branch. And we're, the view's pretty good. We've got a saw in our hand, and we're using that saw to cut away the very branch that we're sitting on. That saw is digital technology. Let's pause, let's use that technology wisely, and let's not cut that branch through. Thank you very much.